So, hi. Uh, welcome. Are you having a good time at Freaknik so far? Yeah, yeah. Up really late last night? Mm -hmm. So, maybe, it's maybe awake, maybe not. Thank you for getting up and being here for the talk. Uh, how many people here have been a member of an Agile team ever? Okay. How, of those of you, how many feel that your companies did Agile right? No hands. See, so <laughs> yeah, agile. Agile is an interesting thing. There's uh, kind of four ways to do. There's four parts of doing agile. You have to get the mindset right. You have to get the practices right. You have to have an environment where you can do it right, and you have to have the right relationships with everybody on the team. So, of those three, of, of the three of you, do you feel that any of those four, your companies did right? Yeah, just not all four, right? Okay. So um, for the rest of, for everyone else here, uh, I'll talk, this is a, a talk about kind of the basics of Agile. It's a type of project management methodology, and I am, uh, I have a ton of certifications in Agile. I'm, which may not make any, these terms may not make any sense. I'm a certified Scrum Master, I'm a certified Scrum Product Owner, I'm a certified Scrum Professional. I also have an Agile Coaching Certificate from the International consortium on Agile, I forget exactly what all the, anyway, I have a lot of initials after my name. So I'm going to be talking about, um, you know, how it kind of all fits together. So there's two main types of project management. One is Agile, and then the opposite of Agile is Waterfall. Waterfall is a step-by-step -step system. So like when you're making an airport, there's plenty of places where Waterfall is perfectly appropriate, like you're building an airport. You want to do things in step, where is the airport going to be? Which way is the runway going to be pointing? Uh, what licenses do we have to get in place? Let's get all our materials, let's pour our concrete. Step, 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 that's waterfall. And you can't really change anything. Once you're at step three, you can't go back really to step two because step two is done. You can't say, ah, oh, I really kind of wanted the runway pointing, you know, kind of 20 degrees this way because it just throws everything off. So you're going step, step, step. Agile is what's called more of an iterative project management methodology. So you do a little piece of it and you show it to your customers, your stakeholders, and say, is this what you wanted? And they go, oh, can you, you know, tweak this? And then you do another iteration. Is this what you wanted? And you go. So it's iterative versus an incremental system. So this is another example of incremental versus iterative. If you're doing the Mona Lisa in an incremental way, you're doing piece after piece after piece until you have the full Mona Lisa. If you're doing the Mona Lisa in an iterative way, you're, you're sketching. So you have the full thing there, but it's just not fully fleshed out. And then you maybe put in some more colors, and then put in some more colors. The advantage of doing it iteratively is like if halfway through, if you're building that airport or that building and you run out of money, money they cut funding, and they say, just give us what you've got, you have something that's sort of there. So I'm going to ask you, the audience, what would be a way of doing an airport in an iterative way? Where you work you have a little bit and you have a sort of working airport. Start with a municipal runway. Pants. Okay. Start with a smaller Cessna style airport runway and then okay. get bigger. Okay, good. Anyone else? Yeah. You know, just do a dirt runway. Do something that a Cessna will do. So you have a little airport and then you can build it bigger and bigger and bigger. And some airports in the world started that way. It was just a little strip somewhere in the jungle and then they kind of expanded and expanded. Okay. So um, there's many different uh, certifying bodies. For the waterfall side, the main certifying body is called PMI, Project Management Institute. And I do have a certification from them as well, which is the PMP, Project Management Professional. In some areas, like on the East Coast, Washington, D.C., PMP is, is like the gold standard. If you have a PMP, you can really kind of get a job anywhere. And it's a really hard certificate to get. You need to prove that you've worked as a project manager for years. You also need to take a really serious test. It's almost like passing the bar. It's, it's a four-hour test. They wand you before you go in, make sure you don't have anything in your cuffs of your pockets or sleeves and you sit down, you've got to take the test. Many people don't pass it on their first try. But if you can get to the PMP, then you can do really well in project management <coughs> on the waterfall side. On the uh, Agile side, there's a few different organizations. The most important one is one called scrumalliance.org. Uh, and they will have that certified scrum master, scrum product owner. There's also IC Agile, which is to the bottom, and they have this kind of peacock of different tracks 
of different kinds of scrum professional you can be. So there's like a coaching track and a developer track and an agile transformation track. And you take so along that track, there's like three different courses you can take until you get to the final end of that pedal and then you get that certification. But you also get certifications for each little place along the track. A little more confusing, but you can show which kinds of things that you're working towards instead of having the full shebang certification. But the Scrum Alliance is still the gold standard. Just there's are, there are these other bodies. So Agile, people have, what's Agile, what's Scrum, what's Kanban? So Agile is this big umbrella over several different of these kind of iterative techniques. So Scrum, which I'm going to be talking about, is under the Agile umbrella. XP, Extreme Programming, you also have TDD, which is Test Driven Development, all of these under the Agile umbrella. I'm not going to be going over all of these, but I'll touch on a few. So the basic elements of Agile, one, you're, develop, you're, you're delivering customer value very, very quickly. You can adapt to change. So you go to the customer says this, and they say no. They give you stuff, and you can go back. And so you can put in those other customer change and requirements that are coming in. And because it's iterative, you're working on the MVP, the minimum viable product. Instead of trying to go, OK, we got to make this huge software package, and we can't deliver it until we have the whole thing done, you go, well, what's, what's a minimum thing that we can get done? And you work on getting that done and show it to the customer, and then you go to another. So you're iterating as you go. And if at some point the customer says, OK, I'm not going to pay for it anymore, you can deliver what you've got to them. You've got that minimum viable product. Okay. Different types of agile development. There's Scrum. I'll go more into Scrum. Scrum has small self-organizing teams. You've got Kanban, where you're visualizing the work as it's going through a series of columns. You have XP, which is co-located teams, and then you have practices that are developed or that are kind of focused on quality. And you can shift the priorities as you go through iteration. So Scrum is named after the rugby term, the rugby scrum, where you're in there and the ball is being passed back and forth very, very rapidly. That's the idea of creating these scrum teams where you have these small, self-organized, uh, self-empowered teams that are figuring out how to do the work. Management isn't saying, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. They're saying, here's a task we want done, dropping it into the team, and then the team figures out how to get it done, which is much more efficient once you can get into that methodology where management learns that they don't have to be managed things on, on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's, it emerged from these lean development techniques, which have been around for decades, where people would do something small and then iterate, iterate, iterate. And then a bunch of guys got together in a ski lodge and said, we're going to try and codify this type of uh, development methodology into a series of specific items. They call it the Agile Manifesto. And now people are trying to organize their companies around this Agile Manifesto. And then the Scrum Alliance was founded in 2002. So this is the Agile Manifesto for my industry, which was game development. So individuals and interactions over processes and tools. A working game, or if not game, working software over design documentation. Publisher, stakeholder collaboration over fixed scope, schedule, and budgets. And responding to change over following a plan. So in Agile, though the things on the right are valued as well, we don't throw them out, but the things on the left are valued more, especially that one that's individuals and interactions over processes and tools. You want to get individuals together communicating, which is one of the essential elements of Agile. Any questions so far? Yeah. So Agile Scrum, I'll talk about Scrum more, works in sprints. Right? In sprints, they're short time box like a couple weeks where people go in and they work on something. So some of the elements of sprints, they have this definition of done. So instead of management saying, OK, build this doodad, and the work kind of drags on, all right, is the doodad done, is the doodad done? It just goes on for months, and you're never sure when it's done. With Scrum, with sprints, you don't start work until you know what done looks like. What is the definition of done? And that definition of done has to be in a short time box of two weeks. So management comes in, a product owner comes in and says, you're going to work, to, they say to the team, this is what I want you to work on. The team then negotiates back to the manager saying, 
well, what is this, what is this, what is this? With the understanding that they're talking about what can be done in two weeks. Then the team having negotiated with the manager, managers asked for something and the team has said, eh, you, know, you want A, B, C, D, and E, yeah, maybe you can do A, B, and C. And then the product, the product owner, I don't know, I really want D done. And then the team goes, okay, well, we can do A, B, and D, but we're not going to get C done. Okay, good, A, B, and D. Now the team has now committed to A, B, and D for a sprint. Management goes away at this point. They're available for communication, but that team is now committed to A, B, and D. Now the team figures out how they're going to get those three done. They've committed to it, so they're now more... Uh, devoted to it. They've got an emotional involvement with getting A, B, and D done. And management knows at the end of two weeks, A, B, and D are going to be done. And then the team shows it to management. And then they go to the next sprint and say, okay, what are we going to do this sprint? So you know what you're going to do kind of in every sprint time box. And management is communicating to the team in some elements this thing called a story, a user story, which helps to define what the business value is of a thing. So I, as a blank, I want blank, so that business value. As a user of the website, I want to be able to click on a button um, that says display credit card inventory so that I can see the transactions of my credit card account. And this helps management to know what is being done and what the business value is of that thing that's being done. So this is sort of a graphic of the whole thing. So again, and also as new requests come in from the stakeholders, which might be management, might be the product owner, might be the users, might be janitors in the building, anybody that's interested in this task, they're all putting their requests into this product backlog. Big stack of requests. Not, not everything here is going to get done, but it's where everything is kind of uh, listed. And then the product owner, their job, and it's one person, is to prioritize the things in this product backlog. Then they negotiate with the team at the beginning of the sprint and say, okay, these are the things that are going to be done in this sprint, this two week, three week, four, whatever the sprint length is. And the team commits to that sprint backlog. And then they spend their two to four weeks and they've now delivered something that's their potentially shippable product increment, right? And they review it. And then they come back and they do it again at the next sprint. During this iteration, they're also doing little meetings, the daily scrubs. Each day during a sprint, the team gets together in a time box meeting in the morning. 15 minutes time box cannot go more than that. And it, it's not a team that's led by, it's not a meeting that's led by anyone, but it's the team to discuss things. And the team's going to, each person on the team is going to say three things. They're going to say, what did I work on? What am I going to work on? Anything I'm blocked on. The team has a short meeting. And then if there's anything that really needs more than 50 minutes to talk about, they can schedule another meeting with the people that have to be there. But then everyone knows everyone else. What did they work on? What are they going to, what are they going to work on? Are they blocked on anything? And then they can scatter and get back to work. So minimum meeting on that daily scrum cycle. Any questions? Okay, so these are also called the scrum ceremonies. So again, you're seeing this iteration. It's just another way of, of, of showing it. You've got the sprint planning meeting where they decide what they're going to do. They build their sprint pack backlog of what they've committed to. They can break it down into tasks. Then they have their daily scrum meetings. Story time is where they're going to talk about what's in the product backlog, about what they may want to do for the following sprint. Sprint review where they show off what they did. Then they have a retrospective to talk, not about what they've done, but how they've done it. This is a time for everyone on the team to reflect and think, how can we work together better as a team in the future? And then <clears throat> sprint planning again, and around and around it goes. So the advantage of this is that at the end of the sprint, you've delivered something, and now your plate is clear. You don't have these things that are just dragging on for months. You go, okay, your plate is clear, next sprint planning, and boom, you jump into that, and you work on those, and then you keep going sprint. Now, this does, obviously, there are other issues with the system. What do you do when bugs pop up? What do you do when you have technical debt? When you see things that need to be refactored, you have technical backlog. Those are stories, too. You write them up, you put them in the product backlog. And again, it's up to the product owner to prioritize. So someone may, someone may say, man, 
that entire billing database has to be rewritten. And then the product owner will say, okay, we'll put in the product backlog. How long do you think it'll take? And someone says, oh, it's going to be six weeks of work. Okay, so at that point, you want to break it up into chunks. You want to break it up into preferably chunks of work that'll take no more than a few days. And that way, it's easier to put in the product backlog. You can't just put something there and say six weeks. Someone's going to say, okay, you want to refactor the entire thing, but you have to be able to break it up into smaller chunks of work. Those go into the product backlog, and they get prioritized along with everything else. So yeah, you got to rewrite the entire billing database. But there's ways to break that up. There's ways to kind of iterate it. You know, what is the, the iterative way, that Mona Lisa way, of rewriting the entire billing database? Well, you're going to identify what needs to be rewritten. Maybe there are chunks that you can break out. Um, there's ways to do it. There are ways to do it. Any questions? Yeah. And the, in the case of rebuilding the entire database, mm -hmm. I assume that uh, in the practical world, is that beneficial? Like, uh, guys going back to old code and saying, oh, this is, this is a terrible way of doing things. Does that happen? Right. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, all the time. As a database developer. <laughs> and um, I mean, but there are different ways to do it. Maybe one way is to rewrite it in a, some sort of development environment, and you spend time, like a week at a time. Okay, we've rewritten this, rewritten this, and okay, now we're going to do a port, and we're going to transition all the data over from our old database over to the new database. And then there's there's ways to handle it. Right. Okay. Right. So. Now there are roles in the Scrum framework where we talked about, so we have the ceremonies in the middle. We got sprint planning, sprint review, sprint retrospective, daily Scrum meetings. We also have these roles up at the top left. So the product owner, they do various things in the system, but the most important thing is that they prioritize the product backlog. So people are, you know, this has got to be, high. no, no, this has got to be high priority. Product owner's word is law. They are the ones that prioritize that backlog. Uh, people can influence them, people can buy them drinks, people can do anything they want, but it's the product owner who makes the final decision. The scrum master is the person who guards the process. This is the person who makes sure that all these ceremonies are happening, daily scrums, make sure that things that are supposed to be within a time box stay within a time box. They're the person that, make, that runs the meetings when we have the sprint reviews and the retrospectives. They're the person that, that guards the process and one of the most important important jobs of Scrum Master is to look for impediments. Anything that is blocking a team member, the Scrum Master is the person that clears those impediments. Find them and destroy them. An impediment could be anything from I need more post-its to um, my computer's running slowly to I can't do this unless this other team does their thing first and help to resolve dependencies. Anything that blocks the team and that leaves the team free to focus on what they're doing, which is developing. So Scrum Master role, very important. Scrum Master also protects the team from anybody else in the company or any of the other stakeholders you know, standing over someone, hey, can you do this? And Scrum Master will throw themselves bodily in front of the developer saying, no, leave them alone. The team is now on a sprint. Let them focus on the sprint. And then roles for the team, team members. Now, one important thing to notice in, in Agile, and many people fight against this, is when you have the team, and the team might be of someone who's a, a programmer and an artist and a QA person, but when you're working in Agile, those roles kind of, the walls kind of d dissolve a little bit. So if you have a bunch of tasks on the board, which might just be a bunch of posted tasks, sure, if you need to architect software, the coder is probably going to want to do it, but you, if you have fixed this bug, it doesn't have to be a coder that do it. It could be someone else on the team who has coding experience that can go in and fix that bug. If you've got art and you need to do all the user interface for something, yeah, it's probably going to be someone with user interface experience. But if you've got something that says, change the color of this button, maybe the QA person can jump in and do it. So you have people really working together as a team. Anybody who has these skills can go in and do it. So you can also have cross-training that's going on with Agile. So those roles, the ceremonies, and then the artifacts, product backlog, sprint, the product backlog, the list of everything needs to be done, sprint backlog, what the team has committed to for a particular sprint. And then there's burn down charts, which some teams use, not all, to track where they are on a sprint. They've gotten you know, half of the things done or two thirds of the thing done. There's, there's more details, but that's kind of it condensed. 
So then Kanban is another type of Agile. This came from Toyota. They developed it. And Kanban means card. And what they were trying to do is they were tracking the cards that were going down the production line and trying to figure out ways of making it more efficient, specifically trying to reduce the amount of waste that was going on in their development system. And they realized that if you just had a bunch of things that needed to be done, step, 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 and something was coming in that was backing up there because this person couldn't get it done. And so they were trying to figure out how to smooth out these lumps in the production process. So they made it into a pull system instead of a push system. So one person was working at one part, when they got done with what they were doing, they would raise a card and say, give me more. And the system of pulling started smoothing things out as they were going through. And they would also have whip limits, which were work in process limits, meaning one person or one team could only do three things at a time. So they weren't getting like 10 things being mm -hmm. put on them. They knew that they could have no more than three. They'd put up a card. If they ran lower than three, they'd raise a card, and a third one would come in. And I could do some exercises here, which just show you with like making paper airplanes, just how much faster the system works. But oh, the uh, elimination of waste was a key co component of Toyota and the Kanban system. This is an example of a Kanban board. So it's basically to do, doing, and done. In this case, they've got backlog, analysis, development, test, deployment, and done. And each column has a number at the top of it, and that's the WIP limit, the work and process limit. So no column can have more items in it than what's on the WIP limit. And then if they run lower than that, they can pull from a previous column. Um, did any of you worked in a Kanban system that had this kind of WIP limit? Yeah. It's, um, did it work? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, and there's also board games that are, there's like a Kanban board game where you can kind of practice with this and find that it's really efficient if you keep your whip limits really low. Because when it's really low and each person only can work on one thing and then you have one thing that enters and zooms through and gets done really, really quickly. It's, it, it's fun to watch it. So another type of Agile, extreme programming, focuses on quality. There's different ways to do it. You can visualize the work, you have short development cycles. And you can do test-driven development. Test-driven development is before someone starts coding, you know what the test is going to be on what they're coding, right? So soft, software isn't done yet, but when it's done, it's going to be tested and it's going to deliver this output. So someone starts coding, and then they run it and say, did it pass the test? No. OK, they got to keep coding. Did it pass the test? No. Keep coding. Did it pass? Well, there's a bug. OK, keep coding. Did it pass the test? Good. They're done. They're on to their next thing. So you write the tests before the code starts. Um, there's also things about continuous integration, paired programming, so you got two people that are looking on the, at the screen for anything that's being done. And so it's different from Scrum. You don't have Scrum Master and Product Owner, but it's, it's another type of Agile. So this is a, an example of something that all of these different types may use, this kind of board. So again, on the left, you've got the product backlog. From the product backlog, it goes into sprint ba backlog. That can be broken down into tasks. And then as each person is going to work on a task, whether it's change the color of a button, or um, fix a bug, or re-architect something, they grab that task, which could be a post-it, and they move it over to in process, so you know it's being done. And then after in process it's done, you move it over into done. And I've seen people do this with big software projects, with games. I've seen one person, he really liked this, and he took it home. And he put a board at home for all his kids for all of their tasks that they needed to do. You wash the dishes, empty the trash. So they would grab something from tasks, move it over to doing, and then move it out to done. And so it was the kids who enjoyed it. He actually built the board in the shape of a car. So the, the post-its were like in the tires or in the trunk of the car, and then they move it forward. So when you're doing these Agile systems, you can do it on, an, there's, there's apps for that. There's plenty of apps for doing it. Or you could do it with just Post-its. And a lot of people do just use Post-its. Many companies, they find it very efficient. Everyone can easily see what's going on. They're visualizing the work. That's an important part of Agile. Um, not just knowing what needs to be done, but visualizing what needs to be done. So moving the Post-its over, and there's just all kinds of different ways of doing that. You can use different color Post-its. Um, but um, yeah, it's a perfectly valid way of doing it. But there's also tools for that. You can use Google Spreadsheets. Jira is one that's commonly used. Of the three that raised your hands, do you remember which tool sets you were using? 
Jira at work, Trello at home. Jira, okay. Jira. 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 Um, Jira is probably the most commonly used one. Has a bit of a learning curve, and for whoever is first setting it up, the configuration can really be a pain. But once it's good, I see nodding <laughs> in the back. But once you got it going, it, it can be pretty powerful. You can also uh, integrate it with other, this is by a company called Atlassian, you can also integrate it with other tools such as Bamboo um, and um, Confluence. Confluence is like a document database or like a wiki. Bamboo is where you can like get everything and start compiling everything and integrate it. And so it becomes really powerful. And the government, um, I know that there are people that use Jira where they have like 10,000 different programmers. And so they've got analysts that are just feeding things in and a programmer doesn't even know what the big picture is. They know that they've got these tasks, they'll grab one, they'll work on it, did it compiled, did it go green or blue or whatever it is. And they'll keep going until it goes boom, boom, they're out of it, they're grabbing their next task. So they don't even need to be involved with the rest of it. So um, Confluence, um, is, as I said, the documentations, JIRA can also handle the bug tracking. And, um, but it does have a steep learning curve. And it's expensive. And it's expensive. There's a per user license. Right? So this is just an example of what Jira looks like, or a way it can look. It can be configured in a ton of different ways. This is another way Jira can look. And so you can get a lot of, each of these is sort of representing the post-its that I showed you in the other slides. Right? And then you can literally click on one of these and then drag it over to the next one. Okay, Pivotal Tracker, different system than JIRA, less expensive, not quite as configurable, but also very powerful. And again, it's set up in these systems where you can have the to-do doing done, in this case we have done, what's current, and then you have your backlog. So you can do it from left to right. In this one, it sort of looks like they're doing right to left. And then you can have the ice box, which are things that are in the product backlog. The product management, and everybody's been putting things in the product backlog, and they're prioritizing prioritizing things. There might be a hundred things in there. And they're knowing there's these 25 things at the bottom that are never ever going to be done, right? So they just move over to the icebox, meaning they're still there, but it's highly unlikely they're ever going to get into the, the finished product. Yeah. Trello, this is one I really like. It's free. There, is, there are premium versions. It's quick to learn, great for small projects. Like if I'm doing a game jam where we're trying to make a game in 48 hours, I'll set up a Trello board and put everyone on it. I can have it done in about 10 minutes. And it, it does expand a lot. And uh, Slack channels, everyone's using Slack channels right now to communicate in companies. There's a lot of plugins. So with Trello, you can be on a Slack channel and you can type a command and it'll put a card straight into Trello of something that needs to be done. So really quick, cost ranges are all over the place. Um, they're web-based, they're downloadable. Some of them are smartphone capable. Um, it really depends what you want for a particular project. Um, if we have time, I will do a Trello demo. So additional resources. <coughs> Again, if you're in games, I would go to clintonkeith.com, who literally wrote the book, Agile Game Development with Scrum. Mountaingoatsoftware.com. This is one of the guys who was there at that ski lodge when they made the Agile Manifesto. So he does regular tweets, regular blogs about all the different elements of Agile. Tastycupcakes.org has fun ways of shaking things up. Like at a retrospective, often people we talk, okay, how do we improve? Okay, well, this is what worked, this is what didn't work. Okay, maybe things we can do better next round. And it gets really old. It gets really boring after a while. So Tasty Cupcakes gives you some ways to kind of shake things up. Like it could be um, you draw a big picture of a boat on the whiteboard and you tell everyone to just uh, take post-its and put them on the different parts of the ship, the sails, the anchor, the bow of the ship, as to how they felt the sprint went. Did they, and, you know, did they feel like sails, they got power, did they, or all the post-its showing up on the anchor, meaning they felt they had a lot of drag. But you just get all the post-its there and then you just sit back and think, what do you think? And you give the team a chance to talk about it. So it's not management coming in, you need to change this. The team's processes only change when the team agrees that they need to change. Right? Teams are self-empowered. So whenever someone, should we do this, should we do take it to the team. Let the team decide because they are the ones who are best positioned to say what's good for the team or what's not good for the team. 
um, scrum.org, scrumalliance.org. It's a great YouTube video, Agile Product Ownership in a Nutshell. Um, oh, another fun thing I like from, I got from uh, one of the retrospective books on how to shake something up is that you get a bunch of people in a room, six, seven people, a team size is usually five to seven people, and you give everyone a post-it and have them write one letter on that post-it. And the letter is going to be either E, S, V, or P, which stands for explorer, shopper, vacationer, or prisoner. And what that means is you're asking them to talk about how they feel about being in that meeting. Are they an explorer, shopper, vacationer, or prisoner? An explorer is someone who goes into a meeting and they're, they're excited, they want to explore every possibility, they want to know what everybody thinks, they're, they're just everything they want to know. A shopper is someone who's in a meeting saying, eh, I'm there. If I, if I walk away with one good idea from this, eh, I'm happy. A vacationer is in a meeting saying, I don't care, I'm just so happy to be away from my desk. You know? And then a P is a prisoner, I don't want to be here. I'm, told, I'm being here because someone told me I'd be here. So you have everyone write what they think. And I'm just asking kind of you sitting here, like you're in this session right now. Do you feel like an explorer, like you're excited or a shopper? Okay, I'm here, I get one good idea. Vacation, you're like, okay, I'm in a conference. I'm, I'm, I'm away from the office or P prison. You're like, oh my God, is there anywhere else I can be right now? <laughs> and, and then, yeah, yeah, everyone's feeling a little prisoner maybe. And, the, yeah, and then no, once no, everyone, no. sorry? No, no, no. No, no, no. <laughs> And then once everyone writes down that letter, have them pass it to the person on their left in the team. And now that person needs to say why they think the person on the right feels that way. Oh, that sounds dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so have some calls to HR coming. <laughs> <laughs> See, it kind of shakes things up. It gets people, maybe it's a little nervous, maybe it's out of your you know, comfort zone, but it gets the lines of communication open. And so they're like, oh God, another retrospective. So, so there's Tasty Cupcakes has a lot of different ways of running retrospectives. Um, so more books on it. The Lean Startup. Everybody who's starting up a company, every entrepreneur must read The Lean Startup. It's like required reading. Agile, Agile Software Development with Scrum. This is one of the classic books. It's, it's got some old techniques, and at this point it's kind of OBE overtaken by events, so Agile has kind of changed and moved forward. Scrum, the one with the, the uh, seal, with the ball. A breathtakingly brief and agile introduction by Chris Sims, who was, uh, he was actually taught the course with the, where I got my Agile product owner. And what he gives courses all the time, and he kind of condensed some of that in his book. Yeah, there's a question about uh, The third book, mm -hmm. uh, with the seal on it. I think that book is free. It may be. It may be. Uh, it may be. It, it's a thin book it's when, really when you buy book. it. Yeah. yeah, there may be a free electronic version. Yeah, very possible. And then uh, Clinton Keith's book on the right, Agile Game Development with Scrum. Also a must read if you're in the game industry and trying to implement Agile development. So, any questions? Yes? Have you heard of uh, Agile being used in volunteer organizations, or is it primarily only professional organizations? Uh, the question was, have I heard of Agile being used in volunteer organizations, or is it only professional? Open, yes. Like open source development, or? Uh, no, well, you can apply Agile to more than computer programming, right? right? And mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you heard of, like, that, uh, the one I'm thinking of is, like, makerspaces. Mm -hmm. Is there an application there outside of programming, but Habitat for Humanity uses something very similar to Agile. <coughs> you're building a house while you, you build a frame like where you get do, online. You know, okay. get there. When you're helping somebody out, you do a little bit because you only have a weekend, right? And so you need to get enough done to help the person. The answer is yes. Um, I, I'm getting online, but go ahead with the next question. I was going to say, uh, I've worked in several companies that claim to be agile. <laughs> yeah, the name implementations were you know, varied. So what are the, that's the best way to ask this, what are the biggest obstacles or abuses you see when people try to become agile? The, okay, the biggest obstacles and abuses. The, um, well, let, me, let me just get Trello going. Are we married? Yeah, we're married now. Okay, so. Still not on the internet. Come on. It's spacebar, but it's 
Okay. Yeah, yeah, and everyone's saying, hello, Ilanka. Where have you been? You've been off the internet for 30 seconds. Okay, log in with Google. That Google. Okay, so I'm just going to set one up right now. So brand new board, I'm going to call it Freaknik. Right. So right off the bat, it set me up a column. <coughs> so I might do to do, doing, done. All right, so getting ready for Freaknik. What are the kinds of things you need to do when you're getting ready for Freaknik? Get dressed. Get dressed. Oops. Hate bathe. that. OK, next. Bathe. Bathe. <laughs> awesome. Bathe. I'm going to put exclamation points on that one. What? Pack. Pack. Buy booze. Buy booze. Yes? Okay, I think we got enough. So as you get hmm? <laughs> Yeah, we're good. Okay. <laughs> so all right, so let me see. So I might say, okay, I'm getting ready. What am I gonna do first? I'm gonna buy booze first. Okay. <laughs> first. Yeah. Pack. It's gonna go next. Bathe goes on the bottom. Bathe before get dressed or after get dressed? Uh, it's a party I'm the while dog. getting dressed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we prioritize and then we just drag it over. Okay, doing. Doing. And then once we've bought the booze, we can drag it over and it's done. Right? So that's just a really simple example. And there, I set up a Trello board, set up some desk, got it done in five minutes. Yeah? Do you have uh, subtasks? Can you, can you set up subtasks? With Trello? No, with uh, with others you can do subtasks. Try to keep it as simple as possible. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's 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 the goal. Right? Yeah, the whole yeah. goal of agile is to simplify a lot of the crap that you go through and. You just you just buy the booze. You don't have a subtask yeah. of what booze. Now is you can do lists. So all right. So I'm going to do in pack. I might, you know, say my packing list. Right, and then I'm going to say you know shoes. Um, T-shirts, right? Um, you know, socks. Shoes and pants. Yeah, yeah, pants. Okay. Gallery and okay. And then, as you're doing, as you pack them, you know, you can, you know, just saying. Again, this is a very simple example. And then, in the thing, you can see. I don't know if you can see it on the thing, but it's got two out of four. So you can see that two out of the four things have been done. There's also once you've added. I mean, when you, once you've built up a full board, right? Right now, I'm the only person who's in this board, but I might add. Is anyone here on Trello? And I'll just add you. Okay. So, is there a non-cloud version? I don't think so. No. But uh, I'm just going to add Ben the Meek, right? Because anything I have to do, I always put on him. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. All right. And um, let's see. Get a bling on his phone. Yeah, he would. <laughs> you can tag him. All right, all right. So, booze. Yeah. <laughs> so I've added him up here, Ben, right? And so I might say, okay, Ben, you know, you're in charge of this. And and over here, I'm going to say, and there's shortcuts, so I can just press the stick base, the space bar, and it adds me. And I can add as many people as I want to each task. And then I can filter it and say only the tasks that are assigned to me, only the tasks that are assigned to Ben, and, and off we go. <laughs> yep, yep. Okay, so uh, problems with implementing Agile. Um, the most important thing, the biggest problem is senior management. <laughs> senior management has got to be on board with implementing Agile or it's not going to happen. Right? What's this self-empowered team? No, no, no. I told you you got to go plant that tree. And they go, but it's not in the plant the tree. The team goes and plants the tree. Right? Um, for best results, you want senior management to understand the advantages that Agile can give to them. This, this continuous iterative development, the fact that customers are going to be seeing things every two weeks instead of once every six months, <laughs> um, that, that can be a really valuable thing. But you want management to have some skin in the game. And then they're more likely to, to be on board with it. Uh, so that's number one. Um, number two is having a culture 
that understands the teams are going to be empowered. And when you make these teams, which are going to be cross-functional teams, that when someone's on a team, they are dedicated to that team and nothing else. It, one of the biggest problems with, with implementing Agile is um, you put a coder on a team and then someone says, wait a minute, we got a problem going. And that guy is the only guy in the entire company that knows how that thing works. We need him to do this. And there are ways to handle that when you have the, some superstar in there is when the, the sprint, when you're doing the sprint backlog, you understand that, say, there's six people on the team. Five people are 100% devoted to the, to the team, but you got this one coder, a guy or a girl, who's only 50% devoted to the team. And you plan accordingly when you're doing the sprint backlog. Um, there's a, also, I didn't really go over this because it gets more complicated. You can put numbers on each task with your story points and think of it like a t-shirt size. Is this task, is this story a small, medium, or a large? You put them on, maybe you sort them. You put the one that's going to take the most effort in you know, rewriting the database up at the top and the one, you know, fix this button at the bottom. And so then you're small, medium, large. And it takes time over multiple sprints, but a team learns how much it can do. And then you have what's called a velocity. So a team knows that it can do three larges and two smalls over the course of two weeks. So when you're planning what you're going to do in your next sprint, you can do it because one of the really common problems is the product owner comes in and says, I got these six things I want done. And the team says, okay, we, can, we know we can do it. We're going to do these six. And then they don't. They only get like two things done and everything else is like half done. Really common problem. So um, a, a scrum master is going to address that. But when the team says, yeah, we're going to do all eight things in this next sprint, the scrum master says, stop. Let's pick the, the two things that we know we can do. Yeah, easy, easy. And yes, and have the team under commit for a sprint. And then when the team gets those completely done and they need something else to do, they look to the product owner and say, okay, what's at the top of the product backlog? And they take that thing and then get that completely done and then take something else. So that way the team is getting more of an idea of their own capabilities. It's also really important to have a team that's 100% dedicated. Where You'll have management say, okay, the team's going to be these seven people this sprint, and then next sprint's going to be these three people, and next sprint's going to be these five people, and it keeps changing. That's a problem. You want the, the team to be focused and dedicated on that team. Because what happens there is you go through, it's called the Tuckman Group Formation Model, which means you, you have this thing called forming, storming, norming, performing, and then an agile swarming, where when a team works together, they, they learn each other's capabilities. So should have a slide for this. Say you've got, if I had a whiteboard, you have a group of people, dot, 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 just a group. And then over here you have a team, same group of people, but it's a team. What happens for, for a group to become a team? What, what, what's that magic sauce? Anybody? Hmm? Booze. <laughs> Not bad. sauce. <laughs> Familiarity, definitely. Bonding. Bonding. And how does that bonding happen? Conflict resolution. Conflict. Bingo. Yeah. You have a group of people that's going through a problem of sort. They're going to argue. They're going to bicker. They're going to, they're, they're, you know, maybe they're going to fight and they're going to go get a drink or, or they're going to have to go, I don't know, confidence course, get together around a campfire and sing kumbaya. But in some way, they're going to be going through conflict, and which gives them a chance to learn each other's strengths and weaknesses. Oh yeah, you know, Joe, he's really good at this, but he gets really cranky, you know, if you turn your chair this way, and, and, and figuring out how to get along with all these different strengths and weaknesses, and that group can become a team. And once they're a team, they can get really powerful, because now they're making decisions more as a unit, and they're, they're empowered, they feel empowered, and they know that if something comes in, they can decide as a team, yeah, we can, no, no, I don't think we can do that. The team can also decide if they need to change. The team can decide, like, okay, we're, you know, our database guy, you know, he's never really entirely busy on the sprint, so maybe we should only dedicate him 30% and let him or her work on something else. Or we really need another artist, you know, and then they can go to management and say, hey, you know, what are the odds of an artist? And then the scrum master has now identified an impediment, so the scrum master is the one that's going to be going in and saying, our, our team really, really needs another artist, and they're going to go into horse trading, you know, with other teams. Um, so. Those are examples of things that can go wrong, impediments. Anything else? Questions? Yeah? There are a lot of steps to the Agile process. Yes. You went through a lot of them. Are there any that you would like to 
skip over. <laughs> Are there you steps? Can now rewrite Agile and skip over any, any one process you like. Ooh, if I could rewrite Agile and I could skip over any process I like. Um, if I could wave a magic wand, I would get rid of dependencies. But but there's really no way to do it. There, there's things where you have a team that it cannot do step A until this other team gets step B done. And so you have to do a lot of horse trading there. But in terms of the, the actual iterative process, I'm going to have to say it, it depends from team to team. You know, some teams, I've seen some teams say, OK, daily scrums, not working for us. We're all sitting in the same room. We're all talking to each other every day. We really don't need daily scrums. They can get rid of daily scrums. That's perfectly valid and agile. The team is empowered. You want to make sure the team discusses it, takes a look at the manifesto, takes a look at the agile principles, and the, and the team. And sometimes you do that in a retrospective. You don't talk about what did we do. You go up on the board and you write five of the agile values. And you write a line one to 10 under each value. And you give, again, everyone on the team, you give them a post-it. And they can either write a number on a post-it or they can go place the post-it themselves on each one. How are we doing on this Agile value? Oh, we're doing a three or seven. And then you let everybody do their thing. And then you just stand back and you look at it. You think everybody on the team agrees we're a six. This one, well, half the team says eight and half the team says two. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. And then you let the team talk about it. Yeah. Is it important to the team? Do they care? Do they find on that? Do they think, this agile, we need to do better at that value. How are we going to do it? So that's one way to handle retrospectives. OK? That kind of answer? Mm -hmm. OK. Any other questions? I'm, I'm in a, a meeting where uh, my scrum master will not commit to the daily startup, the daily stand-up being only 15 minutes. He's an amazingly good scrum master, okay. except for that one thing. Okay. Uh, I've tried pointing it out. I've tried handing him a book and highlighting the section. He's like, no, I'm well, I'm well aware of it. Okay. And he says, for our situation, we're special. And oh. we, we need an hour long. Oh. Yeah, we'll oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so to repeat, we've got a situation where there's a team where the scrum master um, is not committing to the 15 minute time box, despite multiple reminders. The scrum master is saying the team is special. All right. So, all right, there's a couple different things, ways that this could be handled. If I were agile coach in that organization, which would mean I would be one of the people charged with um, assessing the agile maturity of the organization and trying to keep the organization on track. And this is a full-time job, I assure you. So, Probably the first thing I would do, and I'd already be doing this, is I'd be having one-on-ones with every scrum master in the organization. One-on-one, -on -one, 30 minutes, 10 minutes, they come in and they just talk about whatever's at the top of their head. 10 minutes where I might be talking what's at the top of my head, and then another 10 minutes, you know, whatever. Um, and I might bring up, you know, what do you think about the daily scrums? And do they have a reason for it? But in my mind, I'm also thinking it's not up to the scrum master to decide this. It's up to the team to decide this. So it would probably be something to be brought up in a retrospective. Um, perhaps we could do, do it with those lines. One of the agile ceremonies, how well are we doing on the agile ceremonies? And get everyone to put up a post-it. Um, and if you as a team member are concerned about this, bring it up among the team. And what does the team think? Does all the team think that the daily scrum needs to be 15 minutes and the scrum master is the only person who disagrees? Or does most of the team think, yeah, we need more than 15 minutes for our daily scrum? Um, I mean, how is it affecting the team's ability to produce? Is it something that, yeah, the team is special, which the team should decide. It's not to the scrum master to decide. Or, um, you know, how well is the team doing? How is it affecting the team? The team has the power to say our daily scrum should be 25 minutes long. The team has the power. So I had a so, similar scenario to that. Okay. And what worked for me in my particular scenario Do we want to give him a mic or was huh? I pointed out the cost of the meeting. And I said, we're spending a little over $700 every day on this meeting. And then two weeks later, the meeting was 15 minutes. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Okay, yeah, that's one way. 
But it, it shouldn't be the team, but I should just emphasize that in the Agile mindset, it shouldn't be the team convincing the Scrum Master to be the team's decision. And if the Scrum Master is trying to do something that the team disagrees with, that is something that I, as an Agile coach, would go in and have a chat with the Scrum Master about what the duty of a Scrum Master is. The Scrum Master is there to remove impediments and support the team, not to tell the team what to do. That's, that's just simple Agile methodology right there. Okay. So if you've got 12 people on your team and they're, they're, they're give her more than that, say, um, Usually it's well, five to seven, but if there's 12, if, okay. If, if the team is, is unreasonably large and so they're, they're, they're giving their three point uh, speech. Mm -hmm. of, what I did, what I'm going to do, and am I blocked? Right, and, and it's taking an hour to get through everybody uh, doing that. Mm -hmm. then you could also argue that the team needs yeah, team needs to be split. Mm -hmm. It's not a team size problem, though. It's they want to talk about why their impediment is impediment. Then, the, then the scrum master should say, "Let's schedule another meeting." Let's, the the daily scrum is 15 minute time box. That's one of the gold standards of agile. And if something else needs to be discussed, then there should be another meeting right after the daily scrum, so that people who aren't involved in that discussion can get back to work, and get out of there. Right. Um, one way that I assess the maturity of a team uh, when I'm going in and looking at a brand new company, brand new team, is I just look at the daily scrums and I see how they're run. Is it a case of you got one person who's saying, Jack, what did you do? Joe, what did you do? Mary, what did you do? Joe, what did you do? Or is it people going in and Jack saying, I did this, and yeah, I did this, and yeah, I did this. The second is the mature team. The first is the immature team because it's still one person in control. A mature agile is you've got the team is discussing. One way to enforce that, uh, I heard about at an Agile meeting, is to bring like a five pound coffee can, sort of like the conch from Lord of the Flies, right? So while you're speaking, only the person with the coffee can can speak. When they're done, they hand it to someone else, or someone else says, you know, give it to me, and it's going around. And if they're talking too long, you tell them they have to hold it out at arm's length while they're speaking. <laughs> And that way, they get what they're saying really short, and then they pass the coffee can off to someone else. So there's lots of different things that is the, to fix these impediments. Okay. All right. Any other questions? When you deploy to the testers, so you, you do your sort of whatever and then give it to the testers, what happens when that there's just a full stop there? Like, yeah. how, how do you get around the testers not testing? The whole thing just is grind to a halt. Okay. Fire. So it. So how do you how do you get around <laughs> you the that? waterfall? Okay. At that point. All right. Well. Okay. So the question was, how do you handle it if the software's been done, but it's only partially tested, and then the sprint is over? Is that what you're saying? Sure. Okay. So um, integrating QA is is a, one of the big techniques that needs to be dealt with. People need to understand what is the definition of done. Does definition of done mean the software is done and now we're passing it off to QA and a different team? Or does done mean the software is done and it has been fully tested? If the latter, which is, it sounds what you're talking about, on that card, in that checklist, it's going to be, okay, the software has been written, um, it's been integrated with other things, and it's been tested. And the QA needs to check off the tester mark for that thing to be able to move over to the done column. If it hasn't been tested, it's still sitting and doing, which means at the end of the sprint, anything that's still sitting and doing just goes back to the product backlog. It's not something that's going to carry on to the next sprint. It's back in the product backlog, and it's now up to the product owner to say, oh, that thing that we have finished, are we going to do it next sprint? Or are we going to leave it in the product backlog? So product owners call at that point. So it just filters back into the, the pile and you yeah, QA, QA, if QA is part of the definition of done, because and it's not done, meaning it's still sitting in the doing column, it goes back into the product backlog. People might be unhappy, but then, then we're doing Agile. No, we're an Agile shop. That's how we're going to do it. So for the next sprint, the product owner and the team is also going to know QA is part of the process, and that becomes part of their velocity. It's not just how long is it going to take us to code, how long is it going to take us to code and to test? That has to be part of defining or so grooming. Next, right. So the next sprint, you go back to the product backlog and hand all these things again and say, here are those five high priority things, test it, and then just twiddle your thumbs? If, 
Well, twiddle your thumbs, meaning the, the developers are twiddling? Yes. No, the, product owner, the product owner can say, okay, these five things still need to be tested. They can go, you know, if the team agrees, they go into sprint backlog, and there's other development things that are going to go in the sprint backlog as well. Or, and a lot of developers are going to fight this, but developers can test too. It doesn't have to be QA that tests it. It doesn't hurt too much. Well, what? no, that, that's a good point, but I mean, uh, uh, and I'm thinking of a very narrow uh, mm -hmm. circumstance where I work in a publicly traded company where we have internal users, internal customers, mm -hmm. and we abide by our Sarbanes-Oxley requirements, so things cannot move until users sign off on it. Mm -hmm. I can test it all day long, mm -hmm. but nothing's going to happen to it until... Okay, so the stakeholders have to approve it, right? Yes, absolutely. So, so that would happen in this... One way to do it is that it was in the sprint review, where the team says, this is what we did, mm -hmm. and they're showing it off to the stakeholders, and the stakeholders can then say, we, yes, this is what we wanted, or the stakeholders, and no, we, that's not what we wanted, and then they need to say what it is that needs to be changed. That button needs to be red. Sorry, we can't accept it until that button's red. It goes back in the product backlog. That sounds like an upper management thing, the, the buying thing. It sounds like yeah. that might be the solution yeah. to that sort of problem. The product owner should be in, the good product owner will be in communication with stakeholders constantly, constantly. Ideally, at the sprint review, there's no surprise like that. Everyone kind of knows that the button was wrong. But um, yeah, it's up to the product owner to do that and then prioritize that. And the product owner can come to the daily scrums. They cannot tell people what to do, but they can communicate. Oh, they're going to try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, individuals and interactions is key. Keep communicating. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, there you go. Agile 101. Thanks, Mark.